European leaders in Brussels trying to solve the debt crisis, agreeing on a long-term solution. A fiscal pact, they call it, that if finally enacted, would actually make it illegal for a member country to run up budget deficits larger than 3% of GDP. Break that law and the member country will end up here at the European Court of Justice, where it will face legal proceedings and ultimately sanctions. But before things reach that point, the current crisis needs to be resolved. And that brings us to this building here behind me, the European Financial Stability Facility, or EFSF, set up to act in an emergency. If a member state can't pay its bills, it's this bailout fund that steps in. Klaus Regling is the head of the bailout fund. So how many people do you have working here? We have been growing rapidly the last 12 months and we are now 25 staff. It's here to this office in Luxembourg where so much hope is now directed. And the question, does Mr. Regling have the money and the credibility it takes to resolve a crisis that so far isn't letting up? Let's start with the recent news of that fiscal compact. Will it solve Europe's problems? Well, the fiscal compact that was decided by the summit last week, Thursday, Friday, was only the last point in a long process that we have seen in Europe during the last 18 months. All right, but is it the final point? Is it the key point? It's a key point. It will not be the final one. Um, we know and we have learned that one cannot expect that one summit solves all the problems, but one has to really understand that it's a one important step and a very important step in a long process of decisions that have been taken since the crisis broke in early um, 2010. We have done a lot to improve the governance of the euro area, particularly the fiscal coordination, um, the coordination of structural reforms, tackling macroeconomic imbalances, all things that critics of monetary union have said for some time need to be fixed in order to have as a complement to the centralized monetary policy and one exchange rate also a more centralized fiscal and economic policy. It remains to be implemented at the national level. National governments are in charge and accountable, responsible for their fiscal and structural reforms. However, it needs to be better coordinated to make it um, work um, in the monetary union better than in the past. And with the decisions, including the decisions of last week, on the fiscal compact, I'm confident that monetary union will function better in the future than in the past. So if that's the case, though, we look at market reaction on Friday afternoon, Monday, Tuesday. It hasn't been positive, has it? It has not been positive, but it has not been a catastrophe either. But the, we we, we saw bond yields rising. Markets, markets are not convinced. Why? What would you say to them to tell them, no, we are on the right track? Markets focus only on one or two things, and they have a short-term view. I think the summit on last week, Thursday, Friday, rightly focused on longer-term issues. A fiscal compact, that is an agreement how to conduct fiscal policies in the monetary union, necessarily is something long-term. It's not for tomorrow, not for next month only. It's for the next years and decades. Markets, on the other hand, we know that, focus mainly on the short-term and therefore um, they don't get the full impact. They don't understand the full impact of the decisions that have been taken. In the long run, this will be very positive. All right, let's, you talk about the long run, though. Has Europe got the long run? Do we have years, even months or weeks, some would say? The, the yields on, on sovereign bonds were rising after the announcement. Yes, true. Dangerously. But they also dropped um, the weeks before, so let's not exaggerate. To make it very clear, the euro will be there for decades to come. Um, but well, my question is, who's going who's to manage it? That. So who's going to manage it now if, if yields are rising? The euro will be there for a long time. Um, and markets um, will understand that there's enough firepower. If um, more countries than the three that at the current situation get financial assistance from their European partners and the International Monetary Fund, at the moment that's Greece, Portugal and Ireland. If more countries think they need it, at the moment there's no other country, but if countries want help, it would be available through European partners, through the EFSF, in the future the ESM, through the IMF, 
the firepower is there. Most of the EFSF resources have not been used so far. Um, the ESM will be pulled forward into 2012 to become operational one year earlier than expected. The IMF will get more money, that was also decided. Um, so the situation is not as bad as the markets Firepower believe. Firepower is rising. Firepower well, is rising and also importantly the summit decided to review the firepower if necessary by March next year, that's um, in three months time. By then we will know um, whether more is needed. At the moment I think we have uh, more than enough. The debts of Italy and if we were to take Spain as well together, you're talking around three trillion euros. We won't even get into Greece, Portugal, Ireland, I don't know, that we'll end up maybe closer to four trillion. You've got, your lending capacity is 440 billion euros, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How can you say we've got sufficient firepower? How can you send that message out to markets? Well, I think your comparison is the wrong one. Um, when I look at firepower and look at what may need to be done, it's not correct to look at the out total outstanding debt of Italy, Spain and the other countries that you mentioned, so somewhere between three and four trillion, because particularly Italy has an average maturity of its public debt of seven years. So the 1.9 trillion that Italy has indeed an outstanding debt will mature over the next seven years and will be rolled over. Um, when we look at firepower, the question is what what may be needed the next 12 months, maybe the next 24 months, mm -hmm. but no more than that. And when we look at that, how much debt matures, what is the fiscal deficit in Italy? It's coming down. Italy is moving towards the balanced budget by 2013. So all the financing they would need from markets would really be only caused by maturing old debt. That's only a fraction, one seventh on average, of the total debt of 1.9 trillion. So we do know, for instance, that Italy and Spain have about 600 billion in maturing debt over the next two years. Um, so that's the comparison with the firepower of the EFSF. But even if you look at it that way, Mr. Regling, in terms of what's needed over the next 12 months, can you honestly say that the money that you have now is enough to deal with anything that can come up in the next 12 months? I mean, out of your 440 billion that you have, I believe around 190 billion is already committed. So you have around 250 billion euros available to deal in the next 12 months that anything that could come up with Greece, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Portugal. No, 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 um, no, no those numbers are not correct. Um, what's committed from our side, from the EFSF at the moment, is 43 billion okay. for Portugal and Ireland. That's their programs which run for the next two years. So everything that they need is already covered. Okay. So you have about then 400 there might billion? Be another hundred, might be another 100 billion needed for Greece. We don't know the exact number because the Troika, IMF, Commission, ECB are in Athens right now as we speak. They are um, designing the second program for Greece. Then we will know what is the financing need of this program over a three-year period. And then the IMF has to decide how much they pick up of that. But let's say it's another 100 billion. So that still leaves about 300 billion that we have. Okay, for let's other say countries. 300 billion instead of my 250. 300 billion, is it mm -hmm. enough for all and these countries? And then we know that the IMF stands ready, in principle, to add about 50% of what the Europeans do mm -hmm. for whatever country asks for assistance. At the moment, there is no country that asks for assistance. So if hypothetical, you say, what are the countries that may need help? People think about Italy, Spain, but they have not made a request. So far, they are able to refinance themselves. Spain um, did it the last few days. Italy yesterday raised on its own without any help, seven billion euro. So they are able to do this. Maybe one day they say we need help, but at the moment we don't know. Um, but with the firepower we have left, plus um, financing that would be available at the same time from the IMF, um, there's more enough to cover all these possible cases, which are hypothetical, um, for the next 12 months without any problem. Well, we've seen a lot of hypotheticals turn into reality, haven't we, when it comes to Portugal and Ireland. So, it, it, I mean, there is an element of realism there when we say hypothetical, is there not? 
you never know what the future brings, but the markets are looking at the two countries I mentioned. Um, and we know what their financing needs might be. They are able so far to finance themselves without any help. So, but even if they asked for help together with the IMF, we, we could do that. If you needed more cash from the member states, how much do you think you could get? That's impossible to say because um, it would depend on the needs at that moment in time. Mm. And at the moment, we don't know at all whether there's need for more. I'm only saying if there were, then I'm confident it would be made available. So after all this discussion about the, the lending capacity that we have left at this point in time, it's more or less 300 billion euros that you have that is not either already committed or is not in the back of your mind, roughly, very roughly earmarked for Greece. That's around 300 billion. We've got 200 billion pledged to the IMF at this point. So really we, we're left with around 500 billion euros. The markets aren't convinced that that is enough even in the short term, as you've said, and taking into consideration all the other factors you mentioned about how debts mature over the long term. The markets are looking to the ECB. Let me put the question this way, the European Central Bank. Does anybody other than the European Central Bank, does anybody have the capacity to rapidly increase firepower into the trillions? I don't see why trillions are needed at all. We okay, look rapidly at the, increase beyond what you have. Yeah, but in, over the next 12, 24 months, um, not that much more is needed. Um, but I have to make one qualification first so that there's no misunderstanding. The 200 billion mentioned in the communique of the summit that will go to the IMF is not earmarked for Europe. Um, that's an important point. Um, it will go to the general resor resources of the IMF, usable for whatever program the IMF does. So Europe will get even less than, than that. But other G20 countries are very likely to also do something similar. So the, the IMF will get more than those 200. But conceptually, it's important to understand that this is not earmarked for any country. It's used for the general um, resources of the IMF, so they can use it where it's needed. Of course, it's true that at the moment, um, European countries are mainly in need of IMF resources. But this is um, not so unusual when you look at the IMF history. In the um, late 90s, it was mainly Asia that needed IMF resources. In the early 90s and the 80s, it was mainly Latin America, South America that needed IMF resources. So it happens from time to time that there's a concentration in one region, and at the moment this is Europe. So that's the IMF story. Okay. Um, apart from that, again, the firepower of the EFSF is substantial. It will be reviewed in March, so if it's not sufficient, I'm sure our governments will take that into account. What might and make it not sufficient in your mind when you say if it's not sufficient? What are the factors? You must have something in the back of your mind. What might make it not sufficient? If we see that more is needed. At the moment, we don't For see who? that. For some of our member states, but at the moment, who we don't is at see the that. back of your mind the number one person that might? Are we talking Italy, Spain? I have no expectation here, but markets um, say it could be Italy, it could be Spain. But again, both countries, the last few days, both have been able to refinance um, their maturing debt um, at a, an interest rate that is higher than they wish mm. and higher than a year ago or two years ago but still lower than 10 years or 15 years ago before monetary union. And the important point is they are able to refinance. But if that were to change, then we would be available together with the IMF and the firepower certainly would be enough for a while. And then we have a re review clause. So the governments of the Euro area countries would look at it. And one more point on the firepower that's important. We are developing a system where our own resources, EFSF resources, can be leveraged by attracting private investors who otherwise might not be interested in buying um, bonds of some of our member states. And but as things stand now, you're, you're confident that with the help that you could get from the IMF, you could handle even a situation where Italy runs into trouble and isn't able to raise money in the markets? Yes, right? certainly for, for um, 12 months or so. Do you think the European Central Bank will not be forced into more aggressive buying of sovereign bonds? That scenario you've ruled it out from your mind at this point? Um, 
It's very unlikely because, again, um, I can repeat, Italy and Spain and others are able to refinance themselves at interest rates that are on the high side. Um, they should come down again. We have firepower at the EFSF. What the ECB does in the end is, on the one hand, their decision, they're independent. But secondly, um, there's a deep conviction in the euro area that um, monetary financing of governments is not the right way to go. These are principles that are enshrined in the EU treaties that gave the ECB a very strong degree of independence. The ECB is the most independent central bank of any central banks around the world. We are very proud of that and we want to respect that. Um, and nobody wants to, to jeopardize that status. Mm -hmm. I think in the long run, it will serve Europe very well to have a strong, independent, um, European Central Bank that decides on its own what is needed, what is not needed. They have only one mandate to guarantee price stability. Um, and the division of labor between monetary policy and fiscal policy is much better preserved in the euro area than in the United States, for instance, where the Federal Reserve tries to achieve several objectives at the same time. The ECB doesn't have that problem and that will serve us well in the long run. Are you concerned about a possible downgrade of your facility by different agencies, Standard & Poor's, Moody's? There is some concern here. Um, the EFSF itself would not be downgraded on its own because our structure is credible um, and clear. But of course we rely on the guarantees of our member states. And um, if, if they get downgraded, France and Germany, you'll be downgraded in effect as well, won't you? Well, um, if all the AAA countries were downgraded in the euro area, which is um, something S S&P has said might be possible, we will see how they follow up over the next few weeks and months, then of course it would also affect directly mm. the um, rating of the EFSF. If only one country were downgraded, then we have mechanisms to compensate for that, like building up cash buffers so that our um, bondholders would continue to, to be assured that all their claims on us are guaranteed by AAA countries or by cash. By how much would your cash buffer be if this, if this happens? It would depend which country you're talking about. Um, if we have a downgrade of all AAA European countries? No, then I think um, we would follow and it would be almost automatic. But if it's only one or two countries, then we can compensate that. Um, by how much? By how much? Well, it depends which country. Um, um, France has a, has a share of about 150 billion and our overall guarantees of 780. So um, that's a big chunk. But all this is hypothetical. At the moment, um, we don't know what will happen. Uh, we will, will address it when we get to that. Um, would that mean that you're going to lose some of your lending capacity if you have to create correct, bigger yes. cash buffers there? Mm -hmm. And you don't see that as a real risk to your ability to deal with another member state needing cash if you're dealing with both a, a downgrade and rising, let's say, Italian bond yields with your same pot of around 300 billion that we agreed on, you're still confident with that money you can take care of these two fires at the same time. It's a very difficult position to be in, isn't it? Of course, I prefer that this does not happen. Um, but if it were to happen, it's all hypothetical at the moment. Um, then the review that will take place in March, and we definitely have enough money till March, um, the review in March um, will become even more important. Could there be a review before March if this scenario happens? Yes, definitely, um, because... You could get more money before March if you're downgraded, in other words. Um, I'm not speculating here, but um, it's very clear that the finance ministers of the euro area meet every month um, to review all aspects of the functioning of monetary union, including these. The summit of the euro area has the next regular meeting in March. If something dramatic were to happen, they can meet any point in time. And again, as I said in the beginning, the commitment from euro area governments to do everything that is needed to preserve the euro and financial stability in the euro area, that will be done. Um, this is something that is often un underestimated, this determination. Do you have enough to cover any downgrade of any particular country? If we get both France and Germany together, was one scenario that's particularly worrying people. Will you have enough 
cash to uh, guarantee a downgrade, uh, to create a cash buffer to compensate for a downgrade of both France and Germany? I don't think it's very realistic to expect that Germany is downgraded um, with only one other country. I think Germany would, if at all, be downgraded together with all, with all other countries. Um, I don't see another possibility. All this is hypothetical. If that were to happen, then I think we have hardly any AAA sovereign left in the world. There are a few, like Norway, Switzerland, Singapore, but no big one would be left. Um, then we have a different situation that needs to be reassessed. What, what would you do? What would be the um, reassessment? But let me say we are, I think, in a structural shift in sovereign bond markets, th and we may not have seen the end of it. After the debt crisis that broke in, in to after Lehman in 2008, um, it has a now become clearer that the traditional risk-free asset which was provided by sovereigns um, is becoming a very scarce commodity. Um, and if this trend continues, then it will affect all sovereigns, including the EFSF. But at the moment, we are not there, so um, I cannot really speculate. But again, if it's just one country that's downgraded, we have ways to preserve our AAA rating, which is very valuable. So let's talk a little bit about your leveraging uh, vehicles. How much have you been able to secure from outside countries towards those leveraging options? So far, we have not offered it. Um, we had preliminary talks. We are still in the final phase of developing it. Um, there are many technical preparations that need to be done, legal preparations. We need listings on stock exchanges. We need discussions with rating agencies. But pledges, have you received in your talks, have you received any commitment, any pledge that yes, we... We cannot really have a pledge before we have the final product available. And also we don't want money at the moment because um, we wouldn't know what to do with the money. First, we would only need the money, this leveraged money, um, if we see that there's a need for one or two countries in the Uri area that make a request for substantial amounts of money. We don't have any such request at the moment. So if at the moment big donors, these are not donors, these are creditors, um, want to buy into our leveraged products, I have to say we don't need the money at the moment. Um, there's no need for it. How much do you think then, after your discussions you've had with huge creditors, and investors, how much do you think at this point you would be able to raise through leveraging? Very hard to say because um, first, again, we need a request from a country. If um, we have no additional program um, to be financed on top of Greece, Portugal and Ireland, we don't need um, any additional resources from anywhere and don't need to use these leverage options. Second, it's also clear that at the moment where the general attitude of markets towards the euro area um, is not very positive. It's more difficult than if the environment changes, um, which I think um, we are hoping for um, based on all the good decisions taken by the summit last week. So there are several variables that, that are at play here. You've already made trips to some of these big creditor nations, haven't you, like China. What sort of response did you get there? Well, I've talked to important investors and um, I know investors who have bought EFSF bonds in the past on the several occasions that we issued bonds. And some of these big investors are always there. Um, and um, what I have discussed with them is how we need to structure these leverage options so that they are accepted by the markets at the time when we want to offer them. So that was the main purpose of, of my traveling to large investors in the past. I continue to do that. Um, but it was not the moment to ask for concrete pledges. Okay, but aside from concrete pledges, did you get any indication when you went to China that, yes, we would be interested once you launch this leverage option, we'll be interested in buying some of it? Any indication? Yes, I had a lot of interest from investors, not only in China, also from investors like insurance companies who very much like the insurance type leverage options that we're also developing. And there have been um, um, statements, public statements from some of the biggest insurers in the world like Allianz and Generali and AXA that say, yes, once you offer that product in the market, we uh, will look at it very positively. So I do have this kind of interest, general interest, 
but again, too early to have precise pledges. Mr. Klaus Fregling, it's been good talking to you. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. You're welcome.